We're in the last month of our five months of purposes. So what are our five purposes again? Let's, let's kind of just go down through them. The first one is honor. First one's honor. Honoring God with what? Every aspect of our life. It ties into worship. Worship isn't just the song service. Worship is our life. So we honor God with every aspect of our life. The second one is reach. What do we do? We reach people, but don't stop there, transforming lives. It's reaching people, but discipleship, reaching people, transforming lives. Then the next one, the third one is equip. Equipping who? Come on, equipping who? Are you with me this morning? Equipping who? Believers, right? Equipping believers to fulfill their mission in Christ. The next one is share. I love it. Sharing life together through Christ's love. Remember, Pastor Hensel, almost every service at the end says, shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck, tell them you love them in the Lord. Now, I'm going to be quite transparent with you this morning. There are sometimes I love people in the Lord before I love them in Pastor Hensel. <laughs> Come on now. You know what I'm talking about. There are some individuals that, you know, they started out in the enemy category and then you realize the scripture says we're not to have any enemies. We're to pray for those who spitefully use us. And as God begins to do a work on it for us, you know, we start out praying, you know, uh, we're going to pray for you because the Lord told me I'm to pray for you. So uh, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray, Lord, straighten them out. Lord, smite them with the smiter with which you can smite them. And then finally we get to pray, and Lord, Lord, um, you know, help me to have a better attitude. Lord, bless them. But there comes a point in time whenever the love of God is so strong in our hearts and lives that we don't desire to have an ill feeling against anybody. And so we just say, in the love of Christ, I love you. Amen? Sharing life together, doing life together through the love of Christ. And then this month, serve, serving Christ serving others the five purposes almost like five pillars of who we are and how we function and what we're all about as a church and then as that God brings us together as individuals those purposes become a part of who we are as we work together in Christ we already looked at that serving aspect and seen that faithfully serving the body of Christ is serving Jesus himself. When you and I are faithful to each other, we're literally serving Jesus. Matthew 25 and verse 40 says the king, and here the king is Jesus, the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for who? For me, for Jesus. Then we understand and we study this, preached about it last Sunday. God also calls us to go into the enemy's territory. What does he want us to do there? He wants us to save the lost, the unchurched, those who aren't following uh, Jesus Christ. He wants us to rescue them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now we've studied the, the different aspects of serving, haven't we? We've gone through at least three messages on serving, and so it's important for us today that we need to take a look at the ability that God has given us to serve. He's called us to serve, but he's also given us an ability, an innate ability in ourselves uh, to serve. And I think a good place to start the process, start looking at that this morning is Romans, right here in your text, Romans chapter 12. Look down until you find verse 3. Romans chapter 12 and the third verse. Paul writing to the Romans, uh, Roman believers says, for, for by the grace... Important word there, say that with me. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith. Say faith with me today. Faith God has given you, just as each one of us have, uh, has one body. Check it out. Has everybody got their body here today? Have you ever shown up someplace physically and it took a little while for you to get there mentally? At least we're all physically here today. Amen. Okay. 
So just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, praise God, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. Oh, I love this passage. Different gifts according to the, say it with me, grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesied, prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor uh, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fever serving the Lord. Amen. What a powerful passage of scripture this morning. You know, service, service, the ability to serve is a gift from God. Service, our ability to serve is a gift from God. And the Apostle Paul in this passage I just read mentions three catalysts. He gives three catalysts. The first one is faith. The second one is grace. And the third one is love. So let's see how those three catalysts apply to our gift of service. First of all, faith. Paul talks about faith to claim our place in the body of Christ. We prayed earlier because we know that God brought us through the Holy Spirit, through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and then the Holy Spirit literally took us from the enemy's camp and placed us in the family of God. Now, I know there are some believers, I don't think there's any in the house today, but I know that there's some believers who believe that they were never really bad enough to be in the enemy's camp. But I just have to remind everybody that all of us were in that place. It doesn't matter what our opinion was of ourselves. All of us were hopelessly lost in sin, needing the salvation that can only come through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we were brought from the enemy's camp and placed in the family of God. You are a part of the family of God. But we have to have faith then to take it even further and claim our place in the body of Christ. It says you have been saved by grace for a purpose. You've been saved by grace for a purpose. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is what? A gift of God. Not of works that least anyone should boast. Now verse 10 is so important. Listen. For we are his workmanship, created, created from the very beginning, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should think about it. That we should pray about it. That we should try to avoid it at any cost possible. No, that's not what it says. It says, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So since our salvation is a gift from God with a purpose, right? Since our salvation is a gift from God with a purpose, then we are to view our life as a gift from God with a purpose as well. God saved you for a purpose, sir. He saved you for a reason, ma'am. Your life is a blessing. Sometimes our life doesn't feel like a blessing. But we can't always go by how we feel, amen? This morning, Pastor Hensel is not feeling too good physically. But man, am I feeling great spiritually. See, if I'd have gone by how I felt this morning, I wouldn't be here right now. Right? But I knew 
The spirit was stirring in my spirit. When I was up this morning at five o'clock studying and preparing, God was stirring my spirit about what he wanted to do in the house today. I got to confess, I had to lay down a little bit after that time of studying because the energy level wasn't there. But praise God, I got up, got a shower, said, Lord, you're going to have to help your servant today. And because we don't go by feeling, we go by faith and the truth of the word of God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then we know that our life has a purpose and we look at our life not being random but having a purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, what does he say? We're created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works which God prepared when? Beforehand, before we even thought about it, he already had a plan that we should walk in them. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, our text says, for by, for by the grace given, Given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the what? Measure of faith that God has given you. Now that word faith there that Paul inserted is the Greek word pistis. Well, pastor, what does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. That word pistis in the Greek means moral conviction. But listen, it's moral conviction based on the truthfulness of God. How truthful is God? He cannot lie. He is perfect and right in everything that he says and does. So the foundation, the standard is the truthfulness of God. Then our moral conviction about what is truthful in God, that's our faith. It's an action. We don't just think about it. We put into action. A conviction is something that we live by, something that guides us. And so we have a moral conviction that God is truthful, and therefore we have a moral conviction of everything that he says to us. We can take it to the bank. We can count on it. God speaks into our lives his value and purpose for us. It doesn't matter what anybody else has told you. You know, being in men's ministries for 25 plus years, I've had opportunity to minister to a lot of men who got a lot of really good encouragement, I'm being sarcastic right now, in their early stages of life. They had wonderful authority figures that didn't speak anything good in their life at all and who were bad examples for them. And so then they grow up to manhood and they're trying to figure out how to be a godly man and they have no, no examples to follow by from their past. And so God begins to put uh, mentors and individuals in their lives, but sometimes those same men are reluctant to connect with other godly men and so they separate themselves, they isolate themselves and they begin to think that they don't have worth, that they don't have value, that God really doesn't have a purpose in their life and so they have to try to figure it out on their own. Now, I began talking about men, but I want to share with you that I've counseled and ministered to ladies the same exact thing. But you need to know and understand that your life has value and your life has purpose, not because mom or dad said so, not because a pastor or a Sunday school teacher said so, although it's all right to get confirmation, because Jesus said so, because God said so. Can I get an amen this morning? You have a valued place also in the body of Christ. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. Now, I'm going to pause there for just a moment. We don't always think about all the members of our body, do we? But if we ever stop to think, we would really appreciate them. You know, back earlier this summer, I tried to cut that finger off. Thank the Lord I didn't succeed. You know, there's some things in life you don't want to succeed at, and that's one of those things. I'm so glad. Now, the thing is, is if I lost that finger, I have nothing right there to press against my thumb. So now I'm limited in what I can do in trying to turn a page. Now, you say, well, you could shift to the other finger. Oh, yeah, I could shift to the other finger. But, boy, this is so much better. This is what it's equipped and designed to do, correct? Right? So think about it. Which is better? 
for your body to limp through life missing one of its parts and making do by using some others or is it better to have every part in its place doing exactly what God created for it to do are you getting the point this morning yes the body of Christ can continue to function but God had a perfect plan and you are a part of the perfect plan so you have value in the kingdom of God but also in the body of Christ God has a purpose and a plan for you so the verse 5 says, so in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Think about this for a moment. The more students a teacher has in the class, the less individual attention the teacher is able to give to each student. Does that make sense? That's why in Florida they tried to pass a law limiting the class size. So the more students are in the class, the less individual attention that a teacher can give each one of the students. Think about it this way. The larger the company you belong to, the larger the company you belong to, the less connection you have with the ownership most of the time. Does that make sense? If it's a huge company, many times you won't ever see the owner. You won't even ever get to talk to the owner. That's just, that's just kind of a natural thing. But here's where it's different. This is the transition. See, the body of Christ is extremely large. We have members in the body of Christ all over the world uh, numbering in the billions, right? But Jesus has a personal connection with each and every one of them. Each and every one of them. Jesus has a personal connection with you today. You're highly favored by the Lord. Come on, sir, ma'am, listen to what pastor is saying. Don't, don't just push it off. You are highly favored by the Lord. I'm pausing here because I want the Holy Spirit to have opportunity to minister these words in the heart of every single person here today. You are highly favored favored by the Lord. Jesus has already determined your place and your purpose in the body of Christ. Amen? We're important to, to the success of each other. Therefore, we have to stay connected. See, by faith in God's faithfulness, we claim our place in the body of Christ. And then Paul goes on to the next thing. He talks about grace. Paul says grace that empowers us to fulfill our mission in the body. Each of us have a valued place and purpose in the body of Christ, but the grace of God empowers us to fulfill our mission in the body. Our abilities are a gift of God's grace. Our salvation is a gift of God's grace. Our abilities are a gift of God's grace. Look with me, Romans chapter 12, verse 6, the very first part of it. Paul writes, we have different gifts according to what? According to the grace given us. Many times when we're reading the scripture, we pass over statements like that. It just kind of flows right over. That, well, that was nice of the Lord. Isn't that sweet? We got different gifts because God just, he's just a nice guy. But when we understand that grace is God's unlimited Un unmerited, unlimited favor from an omnipotent God. We have a whole new dimension of grace. So it's God's grace, his power that's given us the gifts that we have that he wants to work in us. God has created each of us according to the purpose that he predetermined for us. You know, whenever I was younger, I knew God had something for me, but man, it was tough trying to figure it out. And I did all kind of things. I won't, try to, I won't try to enumerate all the stuff, but if you look back past my work history, I mean, I, I didn't just jump from job to job, but man, I've had a lot of experience. I've done a lot of things over the years. And so then I, I come into ministry, I finally hit the stride of what God has for me. And I begin praying one day, I said, well, now, Lord, you direct our paths and I understand, Lord, that I got off track, you know, but you direct our paths. So, Lord, how in the world, why, why, did, why did I do all those things? Why did you have me to do all, or why did I do all those things to get to the place where you're at? And then the Lord began to show me how I had used every single job that I had prior to coming into the ministry, how he used the skill and training that I had received in those jobs in the ministry, except for one. 
I was mentally running down the list and the Holy Spirit was helping me to remember the job and the skill and clicking off, you know, how I used it. And I got down to one because, you know, back a number of years ago when I was living in Fort Myers, I was uh, the maintenance supervisor down there at a resort. And I had to, as part of my job, I had to learn how to operate a sewage treatment plant. So I said, aha, Lord. How are you going to fit that one into ministry? I got so good at it, I could drive up to the plant and just by the, you're not going to want to hear this, but anyway, just by the smell of the plant, I could tell what was going on with that plant. How are you going to fit that one into ministry? Don't ever challenge the Lord. I go into a presbytery meeting, we sat down, and what's on the agenda? The sewage treatment plant at Masterpiece Gardens is not functioning as it needs to and it's having some problems. So I was able to give insight into that presbytery meeting about the sewage treatment plant. Why? Because I had operated one in the past and I felt the Holy Spirit said, there you go. (laughs) See, God has already predetermined what he wants us to do. And somebody would say, oh, there's different seasons in our lives. And yes, there are different seasons in our life. But if we pay attention, it is not random. God has us on a a pathway of his purpose in our lives. If we'll remain faithful to that pathway of purpose, then God's purpose will be revealed in us and he's already predetermined where he's taking us. So by God's grace, we have been given abilities to fulfill the purpose for which he has created us. He's got a purpose for us. He's going to give us the abilities. He has given us the abilities and that means that our abilities are a free gift of God's unmerited favor. Our skills and abilities find their greatest fulfillment when we give them back to God. This is one gift we're supposed to give back. As God has given us through his unmerited favor, through his grace, those gifts, those skills, those abilities, they find their greatest fulfillment when we give them back to God. See, God's grace takes our abilities to a whole new level. How many of you all had the ability to walk when you were born? Yeah. It had to be developed, right? You had the potential to walk, but it had to be developed. How many of you all were born full conversation? Some of you, I'm not sure about that. I I think there might have been a possibility. I think think there are some folks that probably come out giving the nurse instructions. (laughs) But no, that had to be developed, right? We had the ability but the ability had to be developed. Well, the grace of God takes our abilities to a whole new level. Look with me, Romans chapter 12, verses six through eight. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it, what? Cheerfully. See, when we give our abilities back to God, he fine tunes them, amen? When we give our abilities back to God, he fine tunes them. It's kind of like we are the clay in the hands of the potter. We're the clay in the hands of the potter. Think about it. When the potter takes that lump of clay and places it on the wheel, he knows exactly what he wants that vessel to look like. He knows exactly. Anybody else looking at it can't tell. But the potter knows exactly what he wants to form that vessel. He knows the purpose of the vessel before he creates it, right? The other thing about it is is that lump of clay has the potential to become anything the potter wants it to become. You and I started out kind of as that, oh, don't get mad at pastor, as that lump of clay. And Jesus looked at us and knew just exactly what he wanted to form us to be, exactly the purpose. We are vessels of honor for God, amen? 
exactly how he wanted to form us, the exact purpose he had for us as that vessel. But only through the work of the potter can the clay be shaped to achieve its purpose. And God has created you and I with such great potential in our lives. When we yield to his shaping process, he fine-tunes our abilities. I know over the years of my ministry, God is continually fine-tuning the abilities that he's given me, taking them up to another level and to another level and to another level. And every time I think I've got there, he shows me, no, son, you've not got there. Just stay humble and let me keep fine-tuning. Anybody know what pastor's talking about this morning? See, God's grace also has supernatural empowerment it will supernaturally empower our abilities as well. Not only does God fine tune us through the process of life. I got to stop. I got to back up before I get to that next. Thing. Because that fine tuning process. I like a sharp knife when I'm cooking. How many, is anybody else? First of all, is there anybody that you don't care how sharp your knife is? You pull it out of the drawer and it don't matter. You're going to use it no matter what. Anybody like that? Yeah. 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 Sister Fran says that, but she always grabs my knife and I keep it sharp. So. But that is true. Me, I want a sharp knife, right? And so when I pull that knife out of the drawer, what's the first thing I do? I check to see how sharp it is and I put it to the stone if it needs to be sharpened, right? Don't you think God does that? When he's getting ready to use us, he has tested us to see where we're at. He knows if we need a little more sharpening, amen? Now, I heard that somebody said, well, pastor, you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I know that. God knows that. But that's all right. I still have a purpose and a place in the family of God. Amen. And so whenever I'm whipping that knife through that stone, see, there's the, the coarse side. That grinds off a lot real quick. And then there's the fine side, and that hones it down. So when I'm done with that knife, boy, I got to watch how I test it because it's pretty razor sharp but it had to go through the grinding process. And this is what I think the Holy Spirit wanted me to say to all of us today. Sometimes we mistaken the grinding process as God's judgment in our life, as God not favoring us, as God not caring about us. We need to know and understand that God always cares about us, always loves us. He will, what does the Bible say? He will never Say that with me. Never leave you or forsake you. Amen? So when God is honing on us, Paul said we need to say praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord for the honing process. Now it's all right to say, oh me, ouch, praise the Lord. Oh me, ouch, praise the Lord. But whenever we allow the Lord to fine tune us, we do so much of a better job. But he doesn't just stop with fine tuning. It's not just about how good we can get at the things. And that's where I want to go. God's grace also supernaturally empowers our abilities. Second Corinthians chapter nine and verse eight, it says, God is what? Able to make all grace, there it is, unmerited favor, uh, his divine supernatural power and intervention to to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency, I love it, in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Now, whenever we look at that, that verse in the context of the immediate thing, the first thing we get out of that is that he's talking about material resources. And there is that reference. It's a strong reference that Paul is using there. But whenever you read down through the verses, Paul is not just talking about material resources. He's talking about the unmerited favor of God that is uh, there for us to supernaturally empower so that, what does it say? God's grace towards you, abound towards you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things that may have an abundance for every good work. Let me just ask you something logically. Is money the answer for everything? No. Somebody once said, money doesn't make you happy. And somebody else said, well, I'd like to try it. <laughs> 
But the reality is, is money can't buy everything. Money is not the answer to everything, and God knows that. And when Paul was putting this down there, talking about all sufficiency, remember what he said to Paul, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. Not my grace to supply material wealth, my grace to supply absolutely everything that you need in your life so that when you're operating in your abilities according to the purpose that God has for you and you stand on the platform to sing, you're not only now singing by your ability, but you're singing under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and ministry takes place whenever you stand on the platform to preach the word of God and you're not feeling good and your head's plugged up and your throat's sore, but the anointing of the Holy Spirit enables you to project your voice for the glory of God. Amen. That's the anointing whenever you're ministering to your neighbor, but you're not sure of yourself or of your testimony, but you step out in faith by what God has ministered in your heart and you begin speaking to that neighbor. It's the anointing that gives you the right thing to say at the right time, working with the Holy Spirit to impact that person's life. And I want to tell you that God has given us skills and abilities more than just teaching, more than just preaching, more than singing. Some of you are so excellent in your job. Looking over at our teachers this morning, amen. Somebody's got to teach our children, amen. Who do you want teaching your children? You want godly men and women teaching your children? Yes, sir, yes, ma'am. And whenever they're teaching because of the anointings on their life, the Holy Spirit can be in that classroom breaking down barriers and helping the children be able to understand. Why? Because those teachers are praying for their children, the ones that are saved and the ones that are lost, and God is ministering to them in a powerful way. What about those who are electricians? What about those who are mechanics? What about those that are block layers today amen I got a gentleman I know get it out here come on Gary Blackard I wanted to call him Blackwell Gary Blackwell Blackard Gary is the vice president of Xerox Corporation Gary has a ministry a Christian Good, solid Christian. He has a ministry. And his ministry came for, as he traveled all around the world, he found that employers were having a problem with hiring Christians. And that really bothered him because being a Christian, he didn't like hearing that Christians were getting a bad reputation. And he said, what the employers would say is, unsaved employers would say, I don't mind them being a Christian. I don't mind them talking about their faith. But why can't they do a good job? Right? So Gary started a ministry. Because what he found, because he was excellent, not perfect, but excellent in what he did, executives and people all around the world would get with him individually and ask him about his faith. Ask him about the God that he served. And what he realized is whenever we're doing excellent in the gifts and abilities that God has given us, then it gives us a platform to talk to other people about the Lord. Who do they want to talk to? Do they want to talk to the individual that always late to work? Oh, help me, Lord, I'm going to get in trouble. Always late to work, takes extra days off. Don't carry the load at work. Other people have to help them carry their load, but they spend all their time going around talking about their faith in the Lord. Or do people want to hear from the individual who is excellent in what they do, who excels in what they do? You know, the gentleman, uh, how many of you all remember the gas station that had the, 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 the horses, the Pegasus with the red wings? What gas station? See if you can remember. Huh? We're just guessing this morning, aren't we? I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's ExxonMobil. We'll have to check on that. I thought it was ExxonMobil. The, 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 guy, the guy who created that said God gave him that vision. He was a good, solid Christian man. And every time the company would get in trouble while he was there, he would go to prayer about it and the Holy Spirit would speak to him 
about what he should do to get out of that situation or work it out with the company. And because he did excellent in everything that he did, people began coming to him. You hear what pastor's saying? God wants to make you excellent in your skills and abilities. He didn't just give you skills and abilities so that you could just make it through life. God's given you skills and abilities so that he can make you excellent. Not perfect, not perfect. That's a man, that's a human uh, projection. Only God's perfect. Jesus made sure we understood that. Only God's perfect, but he helps us to be excellent in what we're doing. Does it always go right for us? No, sir, no, ma'am. But excellence means whenever things go difficult uh, for us or off rail for us, we continue to trust in God so he can see us through. That's what we're talking about, the supernatural empowering, the grace of God that comes in and makes us better than we could ever be on our own. Can somebody say amen? Amen. God does that for us. See, when your abilities are shaped, fine-tuned, and empowered by God's grace, you'll operate in excellence, and you have the potential for extraordinary. Amen? The potential for extraordinary. Love is the last one that Paul gives. Paul speaks of love as our motivation to serve. Love keeps our abilities from being hijacked. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, it says, love must be sincere. And look at how interesting the words that follow that. After he says, love must be sincere, Paul says, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. He's giving a commentary to the statement, love must be sincere. We have to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. See, when our motivations are wrong, the enemy can hijack our abilities for his purposes. How many of you all can think of singers who started out using their gifting and ability in the church and then got caught up with fortune and fame and their life went off track? I was going to list a number of those singers today. I was going to put their pictures up on the screen, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, it's not necessary to point fingers today because just by making that statement, I'm sure most all of you immediately, somebody came to your mind that they had a wonderful gift and talent, but they got off track seeking for fortune and fame and their life got off track. Is that saying, well, you can't use your gifts and talents and abilities any place but in the church? No, sir, no, ma'am. God's given those gifts and the talents and abilities to us so that we can make a living and supply. The key is, are we giving them back to God? What's our motivation behind what we're doing? Are we caught up in fame and fortune or are we caught up in serving the Lord? When our motivation is love for God and others, then our talents will always be used for his purpose no matter where they're at. Love for each other gives us a servant's heart. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another uh, above yourselves. What did Jesus say in the basis for our serving? In Mark chapter 9 verse 35, he said, the one who would want to be the greatest has to be the last and the servant to all. And so if we really want to be great, we give our gifts and talents back to the Lord and we do it in a way that we want to serve others. We want to use the things that God has given us to have a servant's heart that protects us and protects our gifts and abilities, keeps us on track for God. Love for God supplies the fuel of our spiritual engine. I love Romans chapter 12 and verse 11. It says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fever. How many of y'all can claim today that you've always done that? No. No, because our human inclination, we get tired, don't we? Can I keep going? Will it be all right if I keep going? Not only do we get tired, we get frustrated. Not only do we get tired and frustrated, if we're not careful, we get offended. And boy, if we get offended enough, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. Right? Right? But Paul, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, says to us very clearly, beautifully, he says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fever serving the Lord. That's the key, serving the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. No matter what you do, do it to the Lord. Then if somebody doesn't appreciate you the way that you were supposed to be appreciated and maybe you were supposed to be appreciated that way and didn't get it. God knows. God appreciates you. You were doing it for him as well. Amen? 
You know, as a pastor, I have to tell you, I do appreciate it when somebody says, Pastor, that was a good message. Pastor, that really ministered to my heart. So, you know, whenever I'm standing in the back today, if you want to... <laughs> But the thing I've learned is that I can have somebody come out and say that was a great message and I can have somebody else come out behind me and say, well, pastor, we'll keep praying for you. <laughs> but there's an audience of one. See, I want to minister to everybody in the house today. I want to be in the right place with the right word under the right anointing of the Lord so that God can speak individually to every single person in the house today that's ready to receive something from God. But to the end of this service today, if I've honored my heavenly father, that if I've ministered to my audience of one, then I'm okay. Everything's all right. And when you go out into the world, there are going to be those that are going to appreciate you and those that love you. And there are going to be those that don't love you. And there are going to be those who don't appreciate you. But at the end of the day, when you lay your head down on the pillow, if you can say, I've honored my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with everything that he's given me, then you've pleased your audience of one. And it's going to be okay. Can somebody say amen this morning? Service is a gift. Service, our ability to serve others. Service is a gift from God. When we serve using the gift God has given us, then our life is blessed and is a blessing to others. Amen? When we serve using the gift that God has given us, then our life, our life is blessed and we're a blessing to others. So as our musicians come back and we get ready to Move into a time of prayer this morning. What gift, what ability has God created in you? You notice I didn't say just given you. What gift, what ability has God created in you? It started back before you were born. God knew the purpose he had for you and already put the potential in you for that gift or that ability that he desires to use in you to accomplish the purpose that he created you for. Let me ask it this way. What has he given you that you have a desire for? What is it that you have a passion for? Amen? Sometimes we can get confused in what's my gift, what's my ability, what's my purpose, and get overwhelmed by that. But God will let us know. He'll show us. And one of the ways he does that is what do you have a desire for? What do you have a passion about? Amen? So what is it, that gift, that ability that God has created in you? Are you protecting your ability from wrong motives? Are you protecting your ability from wrong motives? I know I've said enough things today to get myself in sufficient trouble, but the message is not over, so I can't stop. So many times over the years, I've seen individuals with great skill and ability, but really without them fully realizing it, their motives were off and so they weren't really using those skills and abilities the way they needed to. And they were doing it in what would seemingly be good things. You know, men and women who were trying to provide for their families and so they had a skill and ability for the work that they were doing, but they were working overtime and overtime and overtime and really never had any time for what the Lord wanted them to do, whatever it might be. That's wrong motivation for those skills and abilities that we have, right? And so we have to protect them. How do we protect them? We keep giving them back to the Lord. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to go? How do you want me to proceed? Have you given your abilities back to God? Have you given them back to him to allow him to shape them? You know, God's given me the wonderful ministry of stretching people. It is a gift. Sometimes when I begin the process, the Holy Spirit begins speaking to me about stretching somebody. Sometimes people get a little irritated at pastor because I'll say, well, what about this? And have you considered that? And, you know, I want you to be praying about this area. Uh, over the years, we've had a number of people that God sent here to Christian Life Assembly of God. And, and uh, they basically said, I, I've just come here to retire and do nothing. I've already done my work for the Lord and uh, it's time for somebody else to do it. And so we developed a new term around here. We don't say retired, we say refired. Okay. Refired for the Lord. 
Because everybody's got a gift. Everybody's got a ministry. Don't matter how young or how old. How many of y'all were blessed on the 4th of July when our children's choir came out here and sang? Amen? Amen? They're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. Amen? Doesn't matter how young. Doesn't matter how old. Some of you heard me tell the story about my mom. She was so frustrated because she couldn't do the things she used to do anymore. She said, but you know, I'm, I'm working on the prayer chain now and I'm helping to organize that and I, I can't stand or walk, but I'll go over and I'll sit at the, at the food pantry and help them fold clothes, but I'm just not doing anything for the Lord. I said, Mom, what do you mean you're not doing anything for the Lord? Some of the most important things we can do is pray, amen. We need prayer warriors in the kingdom of God. So this morning, the question is, what is it? What gift and ability has God created in you? Amen? Are you guarding your motives with that ability and gift? And have you given it back to God for him to reshape? In other words, fine-tune. Have you given them back to him for God to, uh, to uh, uh, empower? Amen? Have you given them back to God for him to take it to the next level? Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? Precious Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And Father, what a joy it is to be in your house this morning. Lord, each of us now have the opportunity to think in ourselves as your Holy Spirit speaking to us. Enemy, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. This is not a time for condemnation. This is a time for the joy of the Lord to speak into our hearts and lives that we are loved and cherished, that we have a place in the family of God and a purpose and a value in the body of Christ. This is a time for us to receive from our Heavenly Father that loving word about what our purpose is and what our gift and abilities are and how He wants to use us. So enemy, we rebuke you. Father God, we come to you right now, dear Lord God, asking by your Holy Spirit, as you've been doing throughout this entire service, minister in the heart and mind and spirit of every single one of your children today. Father God, now bless, Father, in these next few moments, dear Lord God, as you begin or continue or confirm a work in each of us, dear Lord God, of what you're desiring conserving, concerning our gift of service. Father, we thank you for your great love that has brought us to this place and to this point. And we ask, dear Lord God, that you would glorify your name in these next few moments and then in the hours and days and weeks and months ahead as we give those gifts and the talents back to you, Father, so that we might hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into thy rest. I'd like for everybody to look up here at Pastor Hensel. Let me ask you this question. So, Pastor, you've already asked us a bunch. Well, this is the final one. Here's the question. Are you ready to stand for Jesus? Are you ready to fulfill the purpose he's called you to? Are you ready to give those gifts and talents back to him? If that's you this morning, would you stand together with Pastor? I'm ready to give those gifts and talents back to God. I'm ready to fulfill the purpose for which he's called me to. I'm laying everything down at the, at the cross, everything down on the altar, and just knowing that God's got wonderful things ahead for me. Amen. Can I pray a blessing for you? But this is what I want you to do. As I'm praying a blessing for you this morning, I need for you to talk to your heavenly Father. You can receive the blessing, but I need for you to reconfirm with him just what we talked about. Father God, I know I'm valued and have a purpose in your kingdom, in the body of Christ. Father God, I'm giving my talents and abilities to you, Lord God, for you to use any way that you want to use them. Father, I'm trusting in you. Any way you want to pray, do you pray that while I'm praying a blessing. Father God, we're so glad dear Lord God, to be in your house today. Father God, we're rejoicing over our brothers and sisters in Christ who are standing in your presence now, dear Lord God, acknowledging that they have value and purpose to you and in your kingdom, dear Lord God, acknowledging that they have skill and ability that you have given to them, dear Lord God. And Father God, that each and every one of us are giving that skill, that gift, that ability back to you for you to fine tune and shape and empower, Father God. 
now. I pray, Lord God, that you minister in every heart and every life today. I pray that your encouragement by your spirit and your assurance, your firm assurance, shall minister in every heart and mind today, Father God. I pray, dear Lord God, your blessing to remove obstacles out of the lives of your children, dear Lord God, that might be hampering them, Father God, for the fullness that you have for each and every one of them. I pray, dear Lord God, that you bless in their families. I pray that you bless in their physical health. I pray that you bless in their finances, dear Lord God. I pray, Father God, that you strengthen and encourage each and every one and give us a sharpness in our mind and in our spirit, dear Lord God, that, Father God, we be able to discern what is right and what is wrong, what is a trick from the enemy, dear Lord God, and cast it off, Father God, that we'll be able to walk in righteousness and truth, Father God, and glorify your name. I pray for my brothers and sisters that you will give them fruit fruit of righteousness dear Lord God for their lives and for the kingdom and Father God we believe this as we pray together strengthen us together strengthen us together Father God as we believe in you as we trust in you dear Lord God as we give it all over to you for it's in Jesus wonderful name we pray and the saints of God said Amen, Amen.